Hello, I'm Dr. Michael Clark of Hillsdale College, and today we're going to look at international trade and a specific model of international trade. We're going to look at the supply and demand model of international trade when we assume that we have a price taker. This is basically your perfect competition model of international trade, and while it might not be that realistic for all countries, it does help us understand how trade creates wealth. In addition to this, using this model, we can get a good start to understanding the general trade-offs of different trade policies. This model, the price taker model, shows the country at hand as basically a small component of the overall trade picture at large. And what it really means to have that country at hand be a small player is essentially that the domestic changes, the local changes, the changes to your country in supply or demand do not affect the overall price. And now while many of you are from the United States and will be thinking of the United States as the domestic country at hand, it is true that the United States is a large component of the overall world economy. While the United States is a large player, still keep in mind that we are considering its place within the entire world economy. And while relaxing the perfect competition model's assumptions, we will have some effects if we change that model. However, the general insights gained from this model still retain a large degree of explanatory power, even if the country at hand isn't this perfect competition model, this perfectly price-taking model, this small part of the overall world economy. But we're going to do the model as though we are this perfect competition price-taker model because it helps make things simple and understand the general effects from trade. And the, the price-taker supply and demand model of international trade provides tremendous gains in understanding the most fundamental insights that we have learned from the economics of international trade. So let's just briefly look at a domestic market by itself. If you did a supply and demand graph, you would have a situation where you have a price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis, and you have an upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve for the domestic market. You have this magical price right here, the equilibrium price right where the two curves intersect. And you have this component right here, this price, right where those two meet, that's going to be the price that you pay within the domestic market. Then, of course, we can go through in basic economics and say that this top area here is consumer surplus. It's all, the entire area below the demand curve, but above the price that consumers actually pay. What that's really saying is that at, at this quantity, a consumer would be willing to pay a higher price up here, and what they actually have to pay is a price down here. And so what they end up with is some surplus, some benefit uh, when they consume that quantity that is represented by the height in between that area. Right? And this whole triangle is consumer surplus. It's all the added benefit from the consumption of this quantity, this equilibrium quantity right here. And then below the price, we have that producer surplus. Right? This whole area, this triangle right here, that is below the price, but above the supply curve. All the costs of the suppliers are represented by the supply curve. They were willing to supply at different quantities for these lower prices than they actually get to sell for. The price they actually get to sell for is this equilibrium price right here. So for a certain quantity they would be willing to sell for a lower price than what they actually get to, so they get some surplus from the sale of that quantity represented by the vertical distance between the supply curve and the equilibrium price. Anything that's above the supply curve but below the price ends up being producer surplus as the producers gain from the sale of those items. Now, when we do the international trade model, we're basically going to take this same starting point of a supply and demand curve, but what we're going to do is extend this out so we can understand essentially what is actually taking place in the world markets. If we look at the overall world supply and demand, we get a little different story in this case.
Here we see that the world supply and the world demand meet a different equilibrium point. It'd be somewhere lower than the equilibrium point point in our market. That's how we're going to start off the model, by analyzing a situation like this. The world supply and demand is lower than the domestic supply and demand's equilibrium price. Now what happens in a situation like this, where the world equilibrium price is lower than the domestic equilibrium price? In this case, what happens is we get imports. The United States, or the domestic country, will not have consumers continually buying goods for prices higher than the world market. We're going to assume zero transaction or transportation costs here, and that the world market can just supply an endless amount to the domestic market at this price of the world. Again, we're doing a price taker model, so the de you demand from the United States or the local market won't change the price or the demand and supply issues that are going on with the world market. And so if you think about this, the United States producers, their costs are represented by this supply curve here. And the demand of the United States consumers is represented by this demand curve here. Now, if you're looking at the quantities provided to the United States consumers, you can see that all the way up until well, about Q0, that the United States consumer would love to purchase an item from the domestic supplier. The domestic supplier can produce these items really, really cheap, all the way from here up to Q0. Now, if the domestic supplier would like to keep on providing these goods for the domestic consumer, they're just going to say, well, if we're going beyond Q0 here, I need to have a higher price. I need to be able to charge you a higher price. And now, does it make sense that the domestic consumer would buy from this U.S. supplier even though they need a higher price than that PW? Well, no, it doesn't. Because the U.S. consumer does not need to buy a unit at a higher price from a U.S. producer, they can get as many items as they would like at price PW by purchasing the good from the rest of the world. So our supply curve originally just follows all the way up through the U.S. supply curve. But now once we add in international trade, the effective supply curve involves U.S. producers up until the point where the world producers can produce this item more cheaply. And so our effective supply curve runs up the U.S. supply curve and then runs horizontally at the PW, or the price of the world, as the rest of the world can supply as many items that the U.S. demanders would like at that price PW. And so our effective supply curve becomes this kind of kinked supply curve. Now, our domestic demand has not changed. Our effective demand curve still runs up and down the demand for the United States consumers. And so what we end up getting is, wherever the supply crosses the demand is going to be our equilibrium point. Well, our demand curve slopes downward, our supply curve is kinked, and they cross at this magic equilibrium point of price PW quantity Q1. Now, the domestic suppliers supply all of the items up until Q0. They can produce it more cheaply than price PW, and so they will still exist within this market. The domestic suppliers will provide all the way up until price Q0. But we said, in total, we're getting this equilibrium point of PW Q1. And so the rest of the items between Q0 and Q1, or in this graph, labeled that M0, these are all going to be imports. This area from Q0 to Q1 is our imports. Q1 is the total quantity consumed by domestic consumers. Q0 is the total domestic quantity consumed that, is, that comes from the production of domestic suppliers. So Q0 is basically the quantity supplied by domestic suppliers, and Q0 to Q1 is the quantity supplied by 
the rest of the world or the foreign producers. Now let's analyze this model with the ideas of consumer and producer surplus. When we just keep in to dom the domestic market, we end up with a situation where we have a demand curve and a supply curve, and the equilibrium point is where those two meet, and the entire area of surplus is represented by this larger triangle here. In this graph, the areas A and C are represented. And the consumer surplus would be everything above the equilibrium point, and the producer surplus would be everything below the equilibrium point within that larger triangle of the A and C areas. But when we add in this world market and we get the new PW price, we end up with a different amount of consumer and producer surplus. What we end up with is actually a much smaller amount of producer surplus. Area C ends up being our area of producer surplus instead of this much larger area of producer surplus without international trade. This is because there's fewer domestic producers actually making the item now and they're charging a lower price. Right? We're providing a lower quantity than we used to. The quantity used to be the equilibrium quantity here. And now the quantity provided by domestic producers is lower, and they're charging a lower price PW as opposed to the original equilibrium price shown there. But what we get is a much larger area of consumer surplus. Consumer surplus originally would be shown by this little triangle here at the equilibrium price domestically and up and everything below the demand curve. Now we need to look at everything below the demand curve and above the price of PW. So we get this much larger area of consumer surplus. This means that international trade in an industry where we import is not that great for domestic consumer or domestic producers. They face a lot more competition now, and in general, their producer surplus will shrink. However, consumers love the benefits of competition and allowing foreign competition to industries where we may import as we create a much larger area of consumer surplus with the lower price PW. Consumers get a lower price from the original equilibrium price down to PW and a greater quantity. The original quantity from the equilibrium increases to a higher quantity when we allow for imports to take place. So consumers get higher quantity, lower price, and that leads to a much larger area of consumer surplus. When we look at the overall efficiency effects, we have a decrease in producer surplus and an increase in consumer surplus. The original area of consumer surplus and producer surplus was this large triangle here, these areas A and C. The overall effect of international trade in this model is to essentially add this little triangle here, B. So we add in, in terms of overall efficiency, this area B here. We had A originally, we had C originally, but we've added in B. There's distributional effects in that producer surplus has shrunk, but consumer and consumer surplus has increased, but we have this overall area A and B of consumer surplus, and B is the new part of it, the new added efficiency or the new added surplus to the situation when we allow for international trade.